members and coordinators of the Sunlight Gospel Association, leaders and delegates of the following countries. As I name these countries, representative of these respective countries may just rise and wave your hand as a sense of recognition. You may say, praise the Lord. Representatives and leaders of the United States of America, kindly wave your hands and say, praise the Lord. Kindly stand, those of America. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Representative from Switzerland, kindly stand and wave your hand and praise the Lord. Well, I understand that some of the delegates has already left. May God bless them. Representative of the Shet Republic, please stand. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Representative of Germany, please stand. May God bless them. Representative of Nigeria, please stand. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Representative of uh, Kenya, please stand. Representative of India. God bless you. Representative of Slovakia. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Of the distinguished guests, sisters and brother, it is my deepest joy for on the behalf of Jamaica and all Jamaican and extending to you this hearty, warm, and deep welcome to this blessed little island of ours. I suppose the natural tendency um, are the natural way of thinking with regards to marriage whenever it is mentioned or ever, whenever we talk about it is from the perspective of the culture that we are born in, raised in, and are familiar with. But quite frankly, it is my personal belief and I believe it is a Bible, it is a Bible perspective, therefore a God thought that that concept has nothing to do with marriage. And if it has anything to do with marriage, if it had anything to do with marriage from the very beginning, it's been watered down, diluted, perverted to where it has no real value or significance. Um, one of the things that the Bible tells us is that you will know the fruit of whatever tree it is that is producing. You'll know the tree that is producing by its fruit. Isn't that right? Now, marriage in the country that I come from back years ago was seemingly quite stable, quite, quite uh, united, and the, the couples involved seemed to have something of an idea of it, of what it was, but really, it really wasn't that they had an idea of it, it just that the tree had not yet come to a place of fruition, of producing fruit. Are you following what I mean? Because now what we are seeing, if people bother getting married at all, is marriages that are being made out of convenience are... Uh, uh, for the sake of self-gratification, whatever the reason may be, it's outside of the concept, it's outside of the principle. Now, I, I, can, I can believe that marriage at one time, the fact that you have marriage at all, 
I mean officially sanctioned by governments and so forth, the reason that you have it is because of the biblical principle that was established in the very beginning. But because the world has been brought under subjection and uh, under the dominion of, of Satan, that, that perception or that idea that, was, that promoted the thought in the very beginning has become something quite other than what God originally intended it to be. And so it's very important for us, for us to understand, I believe, the ramifications of what it means to be married as far as God is concerned. And if we want to know what it, what it, what it means, then we have to have an authority of what we can go to. And you and I have to come to a conclusion with regards to marriage. And that conclusion is that there is only one authority that represents the thought of what marriage is. And whatever that authority has to say about marriage is in fact the truth. Now, if you don't start with that premise, if you don't start from that position, you're already a goner. Amen. Because you will make marriage whatever you want to make it, however you want to make it, and that marriage will not work in the economy of God. Now, I, there's another thought here that I want, I want to mention to you, and that is the economy of God. We are natural people living in a natural environment. Different natures, different thoughts, different customs. However, we have to know that God supersedes. That means God was before that. Are you following me? God was before that. So what God has to say about it overshadows or even can circumvent or even cancel out completely what the thought of marriage is that we have as far as, can I use the word, our traditional thinking is? Because we're all traditional to some extent with the aspect and the idea of marriage. Amen. Hallelujah. We have to believe in the reality of eternity. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into the... I don't, I don't believe I'll get into the aspect of marriage as far as an eternal entity is concerned. But what I want you and I to understand is that marriage has an eternal objective. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? I want you to repeat that. Marriage has an eternal objective. As, though, as, as, as natural and as physical as it is, and as, 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 as the evidence of, a, all of the naturalness is in whatever environment you are in, wants to convey to you the precept that it is all natural. It is not a natural, it is not a natural situation, it's a spiritual experience. You and I must have that thought as a reality Amen. before we even, we even begin to think about having a successful marriage. If you approach it from any other avenue, you are, you are moving outside of the, of the arena that God has created to bring forth an eternal objective in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Let, me, uh, let me give you a little illustration. Maybe I can give you a little illustration. Um, I am a person that, that um, likes to do a good job. So, and, and, and I like whoever I'm involved with that gives me the job to do. I like for them to be able to sell, say to me, well, you did a very good job. And, and, and at the end of the day, I like whatever I've done to be successful. 
course, you're not like that, right? You don't, you don't, you don't have that perception, right? No, I think, I think that you do. Well, some of us do anyway. Um, and so when the Lord began to open up for us in, in Muhammad, the working on the farm and the self-help program and all of that, my perception going into the endeavor was to make the farm, which we call first fruits, to make the farm the very best that I could make it. And so whenever anything happened that was trying to keep me from doing that, I could get upset, I could get depressed, I could get um, um, irritated, I could get angry, I could get sad, because the external environment had something to do with my, object, my objective. Do you understand? Are you following what I'm saying? It had something to do, and what it, if it didn't do what I thought it should do, or how, it should, how I saw it in my mind, or how I believe it should do because I was serving God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I would, it had the power to influence my mood, my demeanor, my attitude, uh, my position, my place of faith. It had that ability till one day God came to me and he says, why do you think uh, you're involved with first fruits? Well, I said, well, because you wanted something done and you thought I could do it, so you gave it to me to do and I'm doing my very best. Why aren't you helping me? <laughs> and God said, oh, I'm just telling him what God told me and what I told God. And, I, and God said to me, he says, wrong objective, wrong motive. And I got offended. Of course, you don't get offended, do you? Especially when you feel your motive is right. Huh? There must be some mistake here, God. Huh? Now, he said, there's no mistake. He said, I'm glad God's very tolerant with me. You know what I mean. Uh, he said to me, he said, I didn't create you for first fruits. I created first fruits for you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I knew what it was going to take to get you to where I wanted you to be. And I created an environment and put you in the midst of that environment for that environment to do for you what you have asked me to do. Amen. Huh? Because he said, first fruits isn't my objective with regards to you. Huh? Eternity is my objective Amen. with regards to you. And there's something of eternity that I expect from you in the natural arena of where time is limited. So there's something of an eternalness that God wants to demonstrate in whatever given situation that God creates with regards to his subjects or with regards to humanity. And it is especially so with regards to with regards to marriage. Praise the Lord. Uh, I had the privilege one time while in India, brother, to go with some brethren as they were interviewing brides. Huh? And um, they were looking, at, and it was very enlightening to me. You know, I never had that experience in Nigeria. I don't know if they interview brides. <laughs> but in India, they do. And it was very interesting to me. You know, they want to know the family. They want to know um, different things about uh, the, uh, these were Christian brothers, so they wanted to know their faith and so forth and so on. And, you know, of course, looking at the home, looking at the, uh, the brothers and the sisters, the mom and the dad, and see if, uh, uh, the, the, the different quizzings and whatnot going on so that they could find just the right one. And, you know, it wasn't, necessary, it wasn't done by the prospective groom. It was done by the brethren as they went out the elders of the fellowship. How, ma how many of you girls would want to commit your lives into the hands of the elders? <laughs> huh? 
Huh? That's not doesn't make make you feel too comfortable, does it, Jackie? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we really don't we really don't need it's not that we don't need it. It's just that there is a higher order, there is a higher way, there is a an ability for us to move in a spiritual arena that is different than that. Not that elders aren't to be involved, I don't know. But what I do know is that we have the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And there has to be, there, 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 there has to be a, a, a position, a place that we take with regards to the aspect of marriage with regards to God and eternity. Hallelujah. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open them to Genesis, the first chapter. It was, it was God that determined that man and woman should have a matrimonial experience. It was God that determined that. Hallelujah. If some of you women think men are unbearable now, if God had left them in his original state, they would really be unbearable. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, in, the, um, in the second chapter, um, it talks about God's forming man of the dust of the ground. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, burden of the responsibility that God gave him as far as naming the animals and all of that. But in the doing of all of that, there was some sort of revelation that came forth, or some word that came forth, or some acknowledgement of the position of need that man had, though he were male and female, though he were incomplete in himself, there was something of a lack of, that God, that God uh, well, he already knew about it, but he, he moved in the time frame of God to do something about it. And so he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he removed from Adam what the Scripture talks, uh, talks about as being a rib. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that, but what I want to get into is the aspect of the fact that that, that, that information gives us some idea of the, um, the, 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 the environment of how God views marriage and he views it as a blood covenant. Because if it was the long bone or the, 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 the rib, then it was that aspect of, of the bone that generates or brings forth blood. Huh? Hallelujah. And there was, something, uh, there was something that was created in that environment that set the stage for all of humanity that was to, uh, that was to follow afterwards. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, you know, those of you who are looking to get married or wanting to get married or thinking about getting married, our marriage is a possibility up in front of you somewhere, sometime, I would earnestly encourage you to seek the face of God as, as to the reality of what I am saying with regards to the position of, of eternity as God views the operation of marriage. You need that revelation. If you do not have that understanding, if you do not have that that. that, that, that knowing or are beginning to come to a place of of knowing you are in for a very hard time because let me tell you something the the strength of man will always disappoint you no matter how enraptured you are with one another humanity has a tendency to always manifest itself at the most inappropriate time Amen. Amen. huh at the most inappropriate time. And let me tell you something. If you don't have an understanding of the overshadowing of God and the desire of God and the will of God with regards to you being married, you are in for a lot of trouble. 
You are in for a lot of instability. You are in for a lot of confusion. You are in for a lot of resentment. Amen. And, and, and are hurt. And being wounded. There is no people on earth that can hurt each other like married people. Amen. There is no arena in which destruction can be more devastating than in the aspect of being married. Amen. Huh? Now, I don't know what your experience, maybe your experience with all of it, those of you that are married, has just been one wonderful uh, level of bliss after another. I heard your testimony. <laughs> you're, you're working toward eternal bliss. Huh? But I am telling you that in the midst, in the framework of marriage, it is the environment that is ripe for devil activity. Huh? If you take a pool and you heat it up and you keep it heat, and there is some contamination put into that pool, unless you do something about the pool, that contamination will not only exist and thrive, but it will grow to become detrimental to your health if you get into the pool. Huh? So there is, there is something of a concept that we must have with regards to marriage and the ultimate plan that God has for us. Hallelujah. Now, we talked about that arena of spirituality. The devil does everything opposite God. You know what I mean? Amen. Huh? God chose the, the first son. The devil takes the first daughter. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's not only true in Africa. <laughs> It's a principle that I've seen working everywhere. The devil always puts his stamp upon the first daughter. Now, it's a lie out of hell, but in spite of the lie, there is a position of authority that we have to take with regards to that, that, that statement that the devil makes. Hallelujah. So, if God has created an environment of marriage, then it means that the devil has created an anti-type. Huh? And he has, now listen to me, I don't care who you are, where you are, that anti-type has influenced your culture generation after generation after generation after generation. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that the devil is getting progressively um, more wicked because he was a liar from the beginning, you understand. Yeah. It's just that that wickedness, he has be, be, his ability to manifest that wickedness in, in humanity is becoming greater and becoming stronger. And why is that? Do you, do you know why? Because the, the strength of the church that has kept the wickedness at bay has abated huh? and they become weaker and weaker and the devil gets stronger and stronger. So there is an anti-type. Now, you and, I, you and I have to come to a conclusion that there is an anti-marriage. An anti uh, as there is holy marriage, as there is holy matrimony, there is, what would you call it? Wicked matrimony? Evil matrimony? There is an anti-type, unholy, <laughs> that's good, unholy matrimony. And to whatever, whatever your culture is and wherever, wherever it finds its roots, that anti-type, that unholiness has been, been worked within the fabric of your soul. I mean, been working in the... Now, when I say worked within the fabric of your soul, I'm telling you it's been shaping your personality. It's been shaping your personality. And not only has it been shaping your personality, but it has making your personality compatible huh, with the things of the world. Amen. Now, 
I'm going to kind of, you're going to have to follow me. I'm going to flop back over here into the God side, the holy side. It is my belief, and this is my personal belief, but I believe it's borne out in the scriptures, uh, not only in the story of Adam and Eve, but in the story of uh, Rebecca and Isaac. I believe that God has a perfect partner Amen. for everyone. Amen. Hello, are you there? Amen. I believe that God has a perfect partner. Well, they moved it up. Now they want to move it down. Now they want to move it down. Right. I believe that God has a perfect partner. Now, I should say a word right here. Some of us sit on the bench waiting for that perfect partner. God, where's my perfect partner? You know? And, and, and the perspectives are prating around back and forth in front of us. And we're saying, is it this one? Is it that one? Is it that one over there? Is it this one over here? Is it that one over there? No, no. I don't believe that's the way it works. There's an authority that has been given to us in the Spirit. I remember a story. It was one of the first time I ever went to Africa. And there was a sister there. This was probably 15 years ago. I don't know. There was a sister there who was... You know, when they get up into the 30s in Africa, they consider them to be old ladies and they begin to get concerned because they're not married. Huh? Now, am I, am I telling tales out of school? Uh, am I embarrassing you? I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of family pressure. You need to get a husband. Huh? And it's not just in Africa, society at large. The older the women get, the more concerned everybody becomes. Huh? With regards to them being married. Hallelujah. And, and, and of course, you know, in many cultures, it's the bearing of children. And, and the older you are, the less likely you are to have the children that one may desire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there's, a, there's an anti-type, there's a, there's a, a, a type that, that is being created in the, in the midst of an attitude of, that is being created in every culture to work contrary to the Christian. Hallelujah. And every one of us have that propensity to be influenced by that culture. Huh? Hallelujah. Now, I, I was starting to tell you, it's not that you look at everyone that's passing by and wondering, well, is this the one that God has? This girl in Africa, she had the wisdom to go to God and tell God what she wanted. Amen. Hello? Do you hear me? She wanted a God-fearing man. Not just a God-fearing man, but one that loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his might. And not only did she want a man that loved the Lord, God, but believed in this word. Amen. Hallelujah. And she made up her list. It was a pretty long one. And she put it down before the Lord. And she, she waited on the Lord for a long time. A uh, long time. Now, when I came on the scene, <laughs> hallelujah, when I came on the scene, without any prior knowledge to all of this that was going on, when I laid hands on her, I said to her, the light is at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> huh? Hang on just a little longer, persevere a little longer, because the word of the God to her was that she had asked a very difficult thing of God. Because God said, now this is no reflection on the people, I don't suppose, but hallelujah, he said, God said, there isn't any such man. Uh-oh, we are in trouble. There isn't any such man that is available. I have to, I have to create him. Hello? I have to create him, and I'm working. I'm working. It's an almost done thing. Hang on a little longer. Well, within a year, I think, she was married. 
And she was married um, to a fine Christian young man who loved the Lord and at the time was on fire for God. So it's not a matter of just, just accepting anything or everything because they bear the name Christian. Listen to me, brethren. In this realm of marriage, the devil is just as active as he is to someone who is in, uh, in sin out there in the, in, in the world. In the church, the devil is just as much working to subvert, hello, hallelujah, subvert godly men and women from joining forces together to produce the element of oneness that God says will turn over the earth. And there's something of the, the aspect of that oneness that is really demonstrated in the nature, in the makeup. Now, remember, remember that in the beginning, Adam was male and female. Now, I want to try to draw a, um, um, in your minds with words, I'm going to try to draw a picture. Hallelujah. Adam was complete in himself, and the idea or the principle that God did when he separated them is that they would come back together again huh, in a oneness that was external as well as internal. Huh? Amen. Hallelujah. You married people aren't doing, saying too many amens. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, man is... He is two parts male and is one part female. The, the, the soul of man, the Bible always refers to it in the feminine gender. David said, my soul makes her boast in the Lord. The church is always represented as female. Hello? Are you there? So... You take, I have, a, I'm, I have a masculine spirit, I have a masculine body, but I have a feminine soul. So I'm two to one on one side of the spectrum. The woman, she has a feminine body, she has a masculine spirit, and she has a feminine soul. She is two to one, but it's opposite that of man. But if you take the two and the two and put them together, the opposite of one makes three. Huh? Hello? And you put three and three together and what you got is man. <laughs> and But man in a position of fullness with regards to the intent and the idea that God had in the very beginning. Hallelujah. Now, God intended the marriage. Now, let me tell you one of the intentions of God. God, what God intended with marriage from the very beginning was to make marriage a, what do you call, a micro? Huh? A microscopic, uh, that's small, right? A microscopic. Gothic um, demonstration of the reality of heaven. Amen. Now, this thought is borne out in, in the New Testament when Paul begins to deal with marriage. Huh? He says that as Christ is the head of the church, man is the head of the woman. And as man, as woman submits to the church, uh, sub submits to to the man, man is to submit to Christ. So, the operation of the marriage should be, in a practical sense, the operation of the church. And unfortunately, that's sometimes, more than not, very true. We run the church like we run our homes. No wonder there's so much confusion. So on, so much contention, so much uh, um, uh, strife going on. Uh, brethren, I'm, I, I can guarantee you, 
If you look at a church that is in confusion, if you look at a church that is out of order, you can look into the microscopic sections of the marriages in the church, in the, in the, in the realm of, uh, of the church, and you will find that same environment of chaos. Now, I want, there's, a, there's something very important here, is that in Genesis 1, the last thing that God did in the garden was to make the division between male and female and then bringing them back together again in a relationship of what we term holy matrimony. The, the reason, the reason and, and, the, and, the, and the word that was given to them, this is all in Genesis 1 and 2, you can get your Bible, and the word to Adam in the beginning was to what? Take dominion, right? And subdue. That doesn't mean that he was to beat Eve into a place of subjection. It meant that there was a corporate position of responsibility that they were giving to each of them. Hallelujah. To do a certain job. Okay, let me give, it, let me give you a practical uh, example. <laughs> When we travel, I'm the driver, my wife is the navigator. And whenever I try to do her job, we get lost. And when we get lost, and it's my fault, I get contentious. Of course, you don't do that, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. The driver is absolutely necessary, and the navigator is... Ap How would you like to fly in a plane that has no navigator? Huh? Uh, you get on your plane going back home to London, you know that big ocean out there? Huh? You get to thinking about it, and the pilot, well, this is your pilot speaking. We're so glad that you decided to fly with us today. Uh, we have one little problem, and our navigator took sick, and he will not be able to travel with us. But I think that we can work things out. Of course, you would sit there in your chair very, uh, very safe and secure and sound and, and, and probably wouldn't be a bit worried, would you? Huh? I mean, I don't know. You can fly around for a while. Huh? But the fact of the matter is both of those, th both of those people are very necessary in the, in, the, um, in the plane doing what it's supposed to do in getting you from one point to the other point. Amen. Huh? Hallelujah. Well, often the problem is, those, the problem is job definition. <laughs> huh? Because the pilot sometimes thinks he's the navigator, and sometimes the navigator sometimes thinks that she's the pilot. Huh? And I don't know what would happen if the navigator suddenly got up out of his seat and tried to kick the pilot out of his seat. I can imagine what would happen. We have to understand both entities are very necessary to do what needs to be done to accomplish a task that has been given to the pilot of the plane. The pilot was told, you have to get from point A to point B and so much time. God says to a man, you have to get from point A to point B and so much time. And I'm, I am inventing a vehicle to carry you and to do for you what it needs to do in order to get you to the place to do what needs to be done. Amen. We spend so much time on the mechanics of it. Huh? Trying to defend the, trying to defend the perimeters of our space. Oh boy, they're very quiet. Brother Duzil. Hallelujah. We do not have the right perception. We do not have the right idea. We do not have the right thought because our thoughts are not God's thoughts. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So why is it that we think that we can take certain principles 
certain ordinances and conform them to our way of thinking. Oh, the devil has, the devil, the devil, the devil really likes it when you begin to vie for certain positions of authority. He likes it. He'll keep you so involved in the inward workings of the situation that you never even get off the runway. You sit there revving up your motors. Hallelujah. Huh? You like the sound of it. You like the fine vibration feel. But you never get off the ground. Oh, all this power, all, this, all these instruments, these lights blinking, all this technology. And you never get, you never utilize what God invented it for. God invented marriage. God brought forth marriage. God created marriage for the purpose of bringing forth eternity. So in that aspect, there's something eternal about marriage. Hallelujah. Now you're thinking of that thought of, uh, well, it said in the scripture that the, in the end, in heaven, there's neither giving, uh, the, what does it say? Not marrying or giving in marriage. You know, that's right. Because we don't have the concept, we don't have the principle of what the completeness of God is doing with regards to our incompleteness. <laughs> you know, it was the original intent of God. There were, if Adam and Eve, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Adam and Eve had the power to procreate themselves outside of the fall. And it was demonstrated in the aspect of what happened to Mary. Come on, brethren. It says that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And in that overshadowing, there was something that was conceived in Mary that came forth, visible human being called Yeshua HaMashiach. Hello. There was something going on in all that. Why did God put all of that in the scriptures? Why did God? Because he wanted to tell us something about the eternalness of the things that he has created in the earth by which you and I, if we utilize in the correct fashion, will bring us from down here to up here. Yeah. Amen. I, boy, I, you know, I go into the Bible bookstore and there are shelves of books dealing with marriage. Most of them I call Christian pornographic books. Ha! If you want to know how far the world has, uh, the church has slipped, go and get one of those Christian pornographic books and read it. Huh? Huh? There's nothing about God. It's all on a physical level. There's nothing about eternity. It's all on the gratification and the satisfaction of mortal flesh. And it has nothing to do with God. Hallelujah. You know, there is much in the Word of God. Uh, I want to get back to the idea of, of partners. Because we're addressing partnerless, a great deal of partnerless people. <laughs> huh? Hallelujah. Um, the first thing that I would say with regards to that, it is not necessarily the issue of being married. As much as it is an issue of knowing God. Now, listen to me. Do you believe that God knows who you are? <laughs> Do you believe that he has an idea of where you're going? Amen. Do you believe that he has an idea of what you need? Amen. Now, if you believe that, then you must also believe that he will do whatever he has to do in order to accomplish that task. Amen. So you all can just relax now, right? <laughs> huh? We don't get married because we want to know God. We get, we, we get married because we're either lonesome, 
because we want companionship, because we want camaraderie, or we just want somebody in our corner. Huh? And that is all of the wrong reasons to get married. The fact of the matter is, Paul says, huh, that we should be seeking the face of God. God says that we should be searching after the, 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 the relationship with God. And God knows that in order to develop the relationship with Him, at a point in time, you will need someone in your life to enhance and to encourage and to bring to a place of fulfillment that desire that He has for you. When we take the matter into our own hands... Now, listen to me, young people. What I'm saying is easy to say, say, but it's not easy to put into practice. Because time goes on, and we see our reflection in the mirror, and things, we look around and there doesn't seem to be any hope in sight. But we don't know, the, or, the, or realize, the infinitesimal mount, uh, 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 ness of God, the greatness of God, the vastness of God, and the ability of God and the people of God? We don't know that in a moment, in a twinkle, in our God can bring someone into our life huh? and give us what we need. It's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of age. It's not a matter of beauty. It's not a matter of, uh, of, of all of these natural things. It's a matter of what it is it that you want with regards to eternity. Ooh. We are a secular, carnal people <laughs> who look at things from a position of, of secularism and naturalness and the naturalism. Hallelujah. We need to understand that we are not created for the limited amount of time that we have in this arena but this arena is designed to bring about the reality of the eternity which God has made that we are to inhabit. Hallelujah. And marriage is one of those things, is one of the things that God has created to do that job. Adam said... This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There is a blood covenant. And God looks at, God looks at the marriage relationship in the same way that he looks at the functioning of the church with regards to the um, the, the act of obedience that we have in the partaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. The problem is we do not identify our wife or our husband on the level as part of the body of Christ. Hallelujah. We need to understand that God views us in an entirely different way and the fact that he views us that way, his response to us in certain situations is governed by what we do in that particular relationship that he called holy matrimony. Hallelujah. And we bring a lot of destruction into our homes, and then we go around blaming the devil. <laughs> huh? Now I've heard several of I've heard the term priests of the house uh, covering and uh, all of these glowing terms considering the position of, of the husband. But if, the, if that is all true, then there is a position of accountability that we have 
before God in the aspect of how we treat our wife and vice versa. Huh? Vice versa. If the, if the wife is misbehaving, if she has a natural position of perspective, and as she moves on that perspective, it opens a door by which the devil can smite her, the husband, or the children. We are living in a spiritual environment. Hallelujah. We are living in a spiritual environment. And that spiritual environment takes precedence over our natural situation. And anything that we do in the natural realm that disturbs or opens us up in the spiritual realm, don't you, don't you think, not for a moment, that the devil doesn't take advantage of it? Listen to me, brethren. Hallelujah. Listen to me. If you were a Baptist, maybe you could get away with what we're, we're doing. If you were Methodist, maybe you could get away with what the world is doing. If you were Pentecostal, maybe you could get away with what you are doing, what the world is doing out there. But you're not. You have heard a particular word that says that you are the saviors of the world. You don't believe that? How many of you believe that? How many of you believe in first fruits? 144,000. Two witness companies. How many of you want it? Boy, I hope you show more enthusiasm than that when God asks you. Huh? Then the, the, your response has to be different. Because the word that you're hearing is not a part time word. Amen. It doesn't deal with some little segment of the aspect of eternity. It doesn't deal with uh, just uh, a salvation or the initiation of salvation. It doesn't deal with just baptism in water and baptism in the spirit. It doesn't deal with just moving around in the holy place, but it deals with the culmination of the ages of going from point A to point Z and coming in under the overshadowing of Jesus Christ. And if we can't overshadow in our homes, we will not be able to abide or stand the overshadowing in the holy place. We have to come in without spot or wrinkle. We have to come in without blemish. That's what the word says. Amen. It was Jesus Christ that was brought before the Sanhedrin and they, and they accused him and they did all manner of things and brought all these accusations with all these false witnesses. But it was, it was, it was Pilate that pronounced that the man was a just man. He was without spot. He was without blemish. Do you understand? I find no fault in this man. Amen. Do you know everything was done in accordance to Scripture? Do you know that? Huh? The night before the crucifixion, the, the priest was to take the lamb. Hallelujah. He was to take, they were to take the lamb and examine it, looking for blemishes. Amen. And then they were to make a pronouncement. That this lamb was clean, this lamb was pure, this lamb was without spot, uh, without spot or blemish. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Amen. Huh? What do you think is required of us with regards to the position, the place of relationship that we have with one another in a marriage relationship? If that marriage relationship is to, de de to demonstrate the salvation and the plan of God with regards to you and I coming forth in a place of sonship. Do we think that we can have our place of sonship without the, 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 the accoutrements or the, 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 the working out of our soul in the midst of our marriage if we treat our husband disrespectfully or with irreverence or if we talk bad about him or if we go to other individuals and expose him and bring him out into open shame? Do you think that God is pleased with that kind of behavior or the man that is continually working to bring his wife into a place of submission? By mechanical means, not by power of Holy Ghost, not by power of love and a sound mind, not by power of care and tenderness, but by virtue of the fact that he's a man and he has a right to rule. Amen. And he used the concept of submission like a club to beat his wife into a place of submission. Amen. You think God is pleased with that? We are guilty. Amen. We, I say we, we are guilty 
of that type of a relationship, of that type of an involvement, and we need to purify our hearts. Huh? What does it say? Pur- purify your hearts, you sinners. Huh? Double, yeah, double-minded. That's the one I want. What does it say? Huh? We need to repent. We need to rededicate our marriages unto God and allow God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit, to begin to holify. <laughs> Work that one out. <laughs> our marriages, our relationship, our, our place of, uh, of service to one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I go to God. I come sometimes go to God and complain. You understand? Of course, you don't do that. I said, God, why do you make them so fragile? Couldn't you have made them a little more tough? I'm talking about women. Right? Couldn't you make them just a little more tough? Toughen up, sister. Huh? Amen. Huh? Buck up. Put your shoulders back. Huh? God, why couldn't you? Why couldn't you? Why couldn't you make them a little tougher? God said to me one word. He said one sentence. He said, he said "Let he that is strong bear the infirmities of the weak." <laughs> There goes all my excuses. There goes all my plan of attack. There goes all my 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 way out. My way out. Burden of responsibility comes right back here. Huh? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know you need to know what you want in God. You that are unmarried, you need to know what you want. If you want a husband that loves the Lord, loves him with all of his heart, loves him with all of his might, loves him with all of his strength and all of his soul, it's going to cost you something. Amen. 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 Because God is going to want that man to do something that you don't necessarily want him to do. It's going to make you a little uncomfortable. It may be, it may be that you have to spend a little time by yourself. It may be times of, uh, of pain and suffering. Whatever it may be. Hello? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, there's a little story about, I think it's, is it uh, John Wesley and his wife? <laughs> huh? And I think it was the fact that uh, she must have been uh, something, she must have been something because he, he seemed to have to bear a lot of tribulation and trouble. But he thanked God for the tribulation and trouble because it put him in a position, in a place before God that he would not have had had he not had that pressure upon him to push him into a place of prayer. Amen. Huh? Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the, I suppose it's somewhat masculine too, but I have found it more feminine than masculine is the silent treatment. (laughs) Where the woman gets a little upset, the wife gets a little, and then she just doesn't talk. And if you're lucky, she will recognize you. But if you're not so lucky, then you won't even be there. Huh? A non-entity. Huh? Well, what that tells me one thing. She certainly isn't interceding for her husband. Huh? The Bible says that you are to pray for those that despitefully use you. And most of the time, women, when they get upset and they go into that mood, mode, they think that they have been despicably used in some way, some fashion. Now, if I'm telling tales out of school and if it's not true, tell me I'm telling uh, it's not true. Huh? Hallelujah. I'm telling you it's a spirit of the anti-type, the unholy matrimony working in that arena. Hallelujah. Amen. 
to bring division and separation and to bring divorce. Do you know that a, that a man and a woman can be living together as Christians and be divorced? Hello? Because they're not treating one another in the way and in the fashion that God intended them to treat one another? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We need to understand the principle, the concept that God has with regards to holy matrimony. And we need to understand that holy matrimony is God's perspective, not ours perspective. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And that it deals with eternity. How many of you think, well, I won't ask you to show hands. I'll just state my position. <laughs> The Bible says that you and I are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That means that there's something of a reward that is accumulating. Isn't that what, it, what you think it would mean? There's something of an award that is accumulating for us in our behavior in this natural realm. Now what if you and I that are married, huh? what if that is paying a major portion of the reward. <laughs> what if that experience, that relationship, what if that relationship is, is part of that accumulation? Is it going to be debit or is it going to be credit? What's going to happen in eternity? There's some, there's some thought that we go into eternity all on the same level. I don't believe it. And I believe that the scripture states in more than one position that we earn or attain to a certain position with God with regards to what he has put us into and what, he, what we have done with it. Amen. Ten talent. Amen. Huh? Ten talent. Amen, amen. He got ten talents. Blessed art thou, enter thou in here, I give you ten more talents. Amen. Huh? Paul said, I know that I have labored and I have worked and I have stored up for myself huh? treasures in heaven. He also said, well, no, he said, I have a crown. I have a crown of glory. Where did he get that? Huh? How did he get it? By view of the fact that he was dying and going to heaven? How did he get it? in laboring over the church as a husband would be laboring over his wife huh? and the wife working with the husband. Hello? Amen. Working in that environment, working in that relationship, working, laying up treasures in heaven. I wonder what my crown's going to look like with respect to that. It's something that you and I really need to Consider. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to turn over into Ephesians. There's one other thought here. As you're turning, I want to go into Um, the, 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 the word that um, the Lord uses in the Bible for love as concerning himself toward us and as we should love one another is the word agape. Agape, to my, to my the best definition that I have to give you, pardon me, of, of agape is that it is love that is measured by sacrifice. Now, we don't start out at agape, you know. We start out with what the Bible calls filio, which is brotherly love, family love. That's where we start, or at least that's where we're supposed to start, <laughs> Hallelujah. There are three words, but one of the words is not found in the New Testament, and that is uh, eros. 
At least I don't think it's in the New Testament. At least it's never mentioned when God talks about love. And that is where we get the English word erotic. Huh? Hallelujah. And quite frankly, it is my position of understanding that that is where we start from. Huh? Because we are under the nature of devil that is a nature that is erotic. And I have found that, that it seems to be sexuality is one of the best weapons that the devil has going for him. Because everybody is some kind of gender. You're never in it. Male or female. Hallelujah. All right, let's go into um, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I want to start at the verse number one. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love, that's agape, as Christ has agape us and has given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. Savor. That scripture sets the tone, sets the mood for the entire chapter. Huh? Now we like to take out little segments of that and utilize them to reinforce our position of authority sometimes. But it's not meant to do that. The fact of the matter is, God says this is the manner, this is the way that we have to behave with regards to one another, and especially being as in the latter part of the chapter, he begins to talk about marriage. He begins to talk about the relationship of the husband with the wife and the wife with the husband. Marriage, as far as I am concerned, is a total spiritual experience. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. If we understand, we don't understand. <laughs> we don't understand the reality of what I'm saying. You don't understand. Not all of you, some of you might. But you don't understand. That means that anything that happens in a natural realm to detract, to deter, to uh, bring confusion or division or separation, to bring contention, to do anything outside of what the scripture says that we should be doing or manifesting is something of a spiritual nature. Even if it's a headache. And that are a pain in the back. All right, maybe I should say a pain in the neck. <laughs> it's, if it has the power to influence the relationship. Did you hear me? If it has the power to influence the relationship, it is not a set of natural circumstances. If it has the ability to make your countenance wrong toward your partner, it is not a natural set of circumstances. It is something that is spiritual and it's working to bring an anti-type of, of, of relationship into the environment that God intended for holiness. And it begins to demonstrate something other than a holy nature. If it's holy matrimony, it has to be holy nature. It has to have a holy manifestation. It has to have a holy demonstration. Brethren, and the fact that 
We are working in the perimeter of the, 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 the thing that the Bible calls a blood relationship. Huh? It's a spiritual environment and has to be worked out on a spiritual plane. Hallelujah. Be ye therefore followers of Yahweh as dear children. Walk in agape as Christ also hath agape us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice. Listen to me. It's not just the husband. It's not just the wife. It's husband and wife. It's verse 1 of chapter 5. 5 is the number of ministry. Have you ever thought about it? The administration of what God calls walking as dear children, manifesting a spirit of agape. Huh? Uh, he, pre he precedes the ongoing verses that talk about marriage and the relationship of husbands and wives together working in an environment. Uh, um, uh, and he, in, he ends the chapter on that note of marriage and church huh? and the manifestation that God desiring to bring forth. You know, we run around quoting Romans, the, uh, what is it, 50, the, the, uh, the, 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 for the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, how about that manifestation in the relationship of holy matrimony? How, how much is it groaning and yearning to see the manifestation of righteousness? Not only a manifestation, but a demonstration of the reality of holiness. Amen. We're talking about holy matrimony as God sees it. Not as you and I desire it, but as God sees it. He looks at it entirely different. Hmm? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. Okay, I want to go on over to uh, verse... I want to go over to verse 14. No, let's go back up to verse 10. For proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That means, you, that doesn't mean you get up and say, well, you're moving in a bad spirit. I rebuke you, Satan. You don't have authority here. Huh? That means demonstrating a nature of Christ when the nature of flesh, our deviltry, is in your face. Huh? Reproving. The Bible says a soft word. Does what? Right. Hallelujah. Uh, submit the other cheek. Huh? When someone slaps you on the right cheek, what does it say do? Turn your cheek to receive the other blow. Huh? It says when one asks you to walk within a mile, how many are you supposed to walk? Huh? And how many times are you supposed to forgive? Seventy times seven, boy. No, it's more than praying a lot. <laughs> we spend a lot of time in repentance. <laughs> huh? I mean, these are the guidelines that God gives us with regards to the, the aspect of the relationship that we're supposed to have with one another in holy matrimony. 
And you that are not married, this is what the expectation of God is with regards to you. And let me tell you, he's not, in this last hour, the tolerance level is lower. <laughs> Hello? What may have been allowable at one time, God will not allow any longer. Because the time we're living in is very short. It says, but that all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whoever doth make manifest is light. Oh, ye are the light of the world. Amen. Uh, how many of you incorporate that to mean the, the relationship that you have in the home? In the midst of personality conflicts, in the midst of uh, feminine or male idiosyncrasies, how many of you uh, do apply that verse? Or do you think I'm taking it out of context? Huh? Ye are the light of the world. Huh? A man does not have a light, and then he put a bushel over it. Huh? Hallelujah. Therefore he saith, Awake, thou sleepest, and arise from the dead. I, we're taught, now you have to take the context of the chapter with regards to the subjects that he's talking about. He ends up the chapter on the basis of talking about holy matrimony. So he's dealing not only with holy matrimony, but he's dealing with the overall aspect of the church. And one is as important in God's sight and as paramount as the other. And you don't have one without the other. Huh? Hallelujah. Wake from the dead. But well, we could really go, I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> Hallelujah. What it's really, really, it's really saying is awake from sin. Do you know what? There is a scripture that says, that I believe applies, is very apropos. It says, having the, um, a form of godliness... If our relationship does not demonstrate in power, in the manifestation of light, there is something amiss and a need for repentance. Hallelujah. All right, let's go down, down. Uh, giving thanks, verse 20, always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My goodness. Submitting yourselves one to the other. Boy, that's, that's a very important verse because it's, a, because it's not only dealing with wives, but it's dealing with husbands. Submitting yourselves one to the other in the fear of God. God has an overshadowing position of predominance that, is need, that there is need for us to recognize. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Hallelujah. It's not only important for wives to understand the position, the place, and the responsibility, but it's also important for husbands to demonstrate the reality. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, that could say, as therefore even as the husband is subjected unto Christ, so let the wise be also, wise be to their, hus their own husbands in everything. Oh boy. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, that he might cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Praise the Lord. 
Huh? I mean, this is just basic, fundamental, foundational work, principle, basic, that should be incorporated in every marriage, at least with some understanding with regards to how God looks at it. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to stop there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I suppose uh, we could do some question and answers, or did you want to do some work on the blood covenant? Okay. Uh, if you want to ask some questions, I will allow myself to be asked. Uh, we, need, uh, we need the mic. Oh, wait a minute. I'll go over here. Okay. The issue of the first daughter. Uh, I would like um, uh, to have some scriptures, you know, uh, backing that about the uh, first son you know, belonging to God, and the first daughter uh, belonging to the devil. And uh, when we become Christians, you know, what do we do about it to make sure this doesn't work anymore in our lives? Uh, well, as far as the, first, uh, the firstborn as unto God, there are many scriptures in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it says that, uh, um, that the... Um, um, That the, the like in the realm of the uh, uh, the the offerings of God, it always had to be the first. Uh, it had to be uh, um, um, okay. Let's go. There is a scripture in. Um, it's either Genesis or I mean Leviticus. Um, talking about the the coming forth from the matrix yes. huh yeah. um, if we could find that scripture numbers 212 three. numbers 312 Yes, that's a good one. Uh, Numbers 3.12, and it says, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all of the firstborn that opened the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. They were a substitute for the firstborn. Uh, the other, the other, the other uh, reference to firstborn is in when the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. Huh? Oh, same page? Okay, verse? Oh, because the firstborn are mine, for on the day that I smote all the firstborn, yeah, there it is. In the land of Egypt, I hollowed unto me all of the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, mine shall they be, I am the Lord. Does this mean first meal? First meal? Or first born generally, both uh, girls and boys? Um, no, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, oh, what's that? Exodus. I said, sanctify, me un sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whosoever openeth the womb of the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. 
And the Lord, and Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. Verse 12. Okay, yes. Thou, thou, that thou shalt be set apart unto me, the Lord openeth uh, all that openeth the matrix, even every firstling that cometh out of the beast, which, hast, which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, there is another scripture. I don't know where it's at, but it talks about males, uh, human, as being, uh, being the Lord's. What's that? Of, of chapter 13. And it came to pass when Pharaoh could hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord that opened the matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. Um, also you have it in the aspect of traditional Israel. It was always the firstborn male. It wasn't the firstborn daughter that received the inheritance. So does that mean that automatically the first daughter is uh, given to the devil? Um, no. What it means is that the devil usurped yeah. the position or the right of God over the people and he could not claim the firstborn male because the principle, the law had already been set by God that the firstborn male was given to, uh, given to the Lord. So he put his claim upon the daughter. It was, it was the availability. <laughs> that was, it was really the only choice left to him. But it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, and traditionally speaking, you know, I've had enough experience and I've been in your land enough to know the ramifications of the first daughter. Uh, yes, but in Nigeria, it operates in a certain ethnic groups. It's not like, you know, in all ethnic groups. You know, well, it's a spiritual it's principle that I've seen work outside of Africa. It's not just Africa. It's so a spiritual now, principle. So now, what's the place of the first daughter who comes to God? Um, You can break. You can break the curse. It's 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 a usurpous position. It's a it's a usurping position that the devil has taken, on the fact that that was what was available for him to take. You can break it. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks all. Breaks all. Uh, but being saved doesn't necessarily being being saved or redeemed by the blood of the Lamb doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily. Uh, break the curse, sometimes it's necessary for there to have a, an awareness or a knowledge of how the, the spiritual bondage that is working in the situation and that the Word of God is addressed particularly to that set of circumstances. And that particular spirit is, is bound. Hallelujah. Um, there was a, a question that I had had um, with the courtship tapes, um, there was a- Courtship a, what? The, the courtship, um, there was a, I think I'm it's like a six- I'm not familiar with them. It, there are like six, six tapes. Um, okay. And they, they talk about courtship and, uh -huh. and a godly courtship. And one of the things that they had said was um, that you could, um, you have a choice of getting married or not. And, um, and I just wanted to know if you didn't get married, would that mean that you are not in the fullness? That, now, wait that a you aren't I'm in I'm not the... quite understanding what you're asking me, dear. Um, Say it over again. Okay. In the tapes, it was talking about um, that you have a choice whether you, whether God had you get married or not. 
and if you didn't get married, I just wanted to know if you were... Well, there's a scripture... Um, Uh, well, there's a scripture that I, we need to look at. Um, it talks about the eunuch. Um, it says that... Um, uh, where, where is it found? Somebody's going to have to find it. It talks about the eunuch. Yeah. Ninth chapter of men. Matt, what? Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 12. 11, what? 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there were some eunuchs which were made, eun made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. The answer? The answer was eunuch. Yeah, if, 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 if you're not married, the answer is eunuch. <laughs> and there's only, there's only there, and there's three ways that you, there, there's three different ways w with which you can be eunuch. eunuch. <laughs> uh, born, born of the mother's womb that way, and that made, them, uh, made eunuchs of men, or were eunuchs which were made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Hallelujah. Bert? Um, the question I want to know is when Eve ate the apple or ate the fruit, is that what gave the devil the right then to come against the firstborn daughter? And Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say that. Okay. Um, and if you as a firstborn daughter break the covenant, is it subsequently broken for your firstborn daughter and I believe, firstborn grand? I believe that goes a long way, yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Because we have a blood covenant. We have a blood covenant with God. And... Um, uh, and once we begin to use our spiritual weapons with regards to our involvement with sin, we use our weapons against the sin that we've been involved with as far as our humanity is concerned, we begin to break those things that, 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 were, that our, our children were susceptible to. I have a very good example of that, and that is the spirit of, of drunkenness, of alcohol, which was something that my family was plagued with. My, my, all of my, my generations had an alcoholic in the midst of the situation. And I know, I can tell you when that spirit was broken in my life. And when I broke the spirit, my father, who had been an alcoholic for 65 years, stopped drinking. My brother, who was becoming very much an alcoholic stopped drinking and none of my children have been infected or influenced they tried uh, to experiment in that arena but they were not captivated are brought into that place of captivity because I broke the spirit It's 
an opportunity for my mother, who is a firstborn daughter, even though Absolutely. she's not walking with the Lord right now. Absolutely, because it's a blood covenant. It's a blood covenant. Um, and you have, you're not only one with your, your family, but you're one with God on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, you have access by reason of that blood into his presence. And as we are delivered by his presence of those things that have been attached to us because of the claim of the devil that is upon our humanity, we break the loosening of those spirits upon those that are alive. Um, I, I would like to restate Stephanie's question because I, I believe I understand her question. Her question is, if the Lord's perfect will for you is to marry and he has someone that he has chosen for you, whether you know it or not, and you choose not to marry, will you somehow lose being brought into the fullness? Why, why, if you know it's the perfect will of God for you to be married, would you choose not to be married? Stephanie, do you have... Just... I don't think, I don't think that was the question. Uh, um, it, this is the only position, the only place of service unto God is a eunuch position. Uh, sister, uh, sister Nancy back there. Uh, you said that if you're saved, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've broken the covenant of the firstborn daughter. I'm sorry? You said that if you're saved, that doesn't necessarily mean you've broken the covenant. How do you know if you have broken the covenant? Uh, well, I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it because, you see, there, there, there is a position, there is a place that we have by the virtue of the blood of Jesus Christ that is working on our behalf to bring forth the element of perfection. Mm. Now, if you are striving for perfection, it doesn't make any difference what you know or what you don't know. Because as you strive for perfection, any imperfection that is working contrary to that perfection God is going to begin to deliver you of that propensity. And you can be delivered of whatever it is without having any awareness of what it was that you are delivered of. The point is that you are striving to be like God. And as you strive to be like God, all of those propensities of humanity that are under the, the auspices of sin begin to fall away. We begin to be delivered of them. I, I, I have been delivered of so many things that, 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 I, I, that I don't even know what I was delivered of. And yet, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if I am doing what I am supposed to be doing, then I will be where God wants me to be, and I will be what God wants me to be. That's what I thought. God bless you. The question is uh, that my mother and my sister are firstborn daughters, and what can I do for them? I am the the only saved in the family get as close to Jesus as you possibly can invoke the blood covenant you have a blood covenant look the, the blood covenant the, you have a natural blood you have a spiritual blood the spiritual blood takes precedence over the natural blood and as you invoke the blood covenant that you have with Jesus Christ it works to eliminate, annihilate any natural covenant that you have or that has been made because of sin. We are in a place with sin. We start out in a place of sin, not because we were sinners, but because someone sinned. 
The sin of Adam was on me when I was born. I didn't have a chance to sin. I was already a sinner by virtue of the blood. The naturalness of my blood. So as I go to God and get transfused. Huh? You understand? I get transfused. I get his blood instead of my blood. It invalidates. Invalidates. Any claim or position that of her inheritance... That the devil wants to make on me. Praise the Lord. I, I know you're wanting to move on from this question, but yes, concerning the firstborn daughter, should there not be some scripture to reinforce that doctrine? Stating that the firstborn daughter is under, it's the, not, under the assault of the It's of the not enemy. a doctrine. It's a principle. The devil works contrary. You can read the Bible in in the converse. Is that the right word? Converse? You can read the Bible in the converse. If devil takes firstborn, if God takes firstborn male, you can rest assured that there is a claim that God that devil puts on firstborn firstborn female. Because you can read the Bible backwards. Not backwards, converse. If you read it backwards you're in trouble. <laughs> Hey, but what about, um, I've been reading uh, lately, who is, who is well, that? for years there, the uh, First Corinthians 7, that whole chapter where Paul talks about uh, marriage and being married and, and you know, the loosening of, uh, I guess, the area of uh, ma uh, matrimony. Uh, but he speaks, says that he thinks he has the mind of Christ on certain issues concerning uh, 1 Corinthians 7, and he says, Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And that's uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 28. And then he goes on to say somewhere in um, verse 30, um, but I 32, But I would have you without care carefulness. He that is married, care for the things that belongeth to the Lord how he may please the Lord, but he that is married care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Just wondering, uh, what was Paul's, I, I've heard so much that Paul was married, wasn't he married? What is the context of, of his given uh, clarification in that area? Okay, I, I didn't know, wh where were you reading from? First Corinthians 7. Well, it's, you really have to read the whole chapter, but he says... Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 28. Now, are you... Okay, your question was then, what is the context or... Right, what is he actually... I've been trying to just get a context of what he's saying to the church concerning his position as an apostle... Um, of marriage. Is that something that is just we need to get into much later? <laughs> uh, verse 32. Verse 32. Well, verse 28 says, But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. But if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. What is he sparing from being married or? He's expanding on her question about would you be missing God's will if you did not marry? And yet Paul is saying, I think it's better that you do not marry Yes, it was a time of great persecution. 
and the, 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 the prophets were prophesying great distress and persecution to the church. And that's why he was telling them, for this time, he was not laying down a, a law for all times. He was saying, for this time, it is better that you be not married. Please go back over and read that, that chapter carefully. Read, read, read what one? Oh, read the chapter carefully. All right. Yes, it, it was just for that special time he was telling them that it was not good for them to marry. Um, it was not a general rule. And somebody was referring to about Paul's situation as being a person who was not married. Paul was not married at the time when, um, when he was ministering, but I believe that you could not be in the Sanhedrin unless you were married, and you had to be 30 years of age. But the man who was right in this was over 70. The Paul was at the time of these writings, he was over 70 years of age. He was an old man. Do you want to read it? A whole uh, chapter? Uh, there's so much silence here. He said, but for the present distress. Um, The same, the same place where you read a while ago that he, um, he, he said they'll have trouble in the flesh. Twenty-six. Yes. I, I, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be, just like him, not married, for the present distress. And then he began to instruct them, if you are thou bound unto a wife, seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife, seek not a wife. You see, that, that therefore was, pretty much contrary to, to um, Jesus saying that everybody should marry unless you are, uh, uh, you are uh, a eunuch, then you shouldn't marry, you see. And, and Paul was saying right here now, don't seek to be married if you're not married for the present distress. The time here was when the church was under great persecution and, and Paul was speaking to them about this. You know, I was asking that uh, in light of the fact that Paul was writing uh, in a context of distress and we are expecting even greater distress with the atomic war in the next few years uh, would it be better then for us to stay without wives Is that working? Go ahead, talk to that. Yes, I, I, I would not advise. <laughs> because um, the, way, the, 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 the way things are now, um, people want to remain righteous, whether distress or no distress. A lot of the brethren cannot contain themselves they need a wife, they should get married, and let the distress come. That. And suppose uh, you are looking for someone to marry, and you have prayed and waited, and no one comes your way, and you still find it hard to uh, behave well, what do you do? 
I, I believe that God will has a partner for every person. And as we heard before, when there is none, he makes them. And I do believe that the person who really wants to be married, God will show him. Very often, the person is very discriminatory in his own mind or her own mind. And the partner that God gives them, they don't want that one. They want somebody else's partner. So this is one of the problems with us. The problem is not with God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. 